And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery. <coughs> Sorry, screwed it up already. The open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple. A man who is a man who is probably haunted by cliff racers and that horrible, horrible sound, and the and and the man developing the discording tales, the one and only, the man better known as the arc as the Arco poet. How you doing today, man? Good, good. Yeah. Well, of course, uh, I think uh, you got it right on uh, at least this aspect of the cliff racers. <laughs> it's uh, yeah. There is definite uh, strong influence of this. Of Morrowind and then Michael Kirkbride in overall, yeah, uh, setting and much. <laughs> that that and you that and you had been posting it. You had been posting the occasional Morrowind me. Um, oh yes, yeah. <laughs> include including that infamous mod where that infamous mod where somebody decided to go Hydra with um, cliff racers. Must be done sometimes. Oh. Yeah, but to be but in all in all fairness, that's par for that's par for the course because well, nobody nobody buys an Elder Scrolls game for the cor for the base material. No, they buy it for the mods. Yeah, just make your game open. It's okay. Then they will fix it. <laughs> As well, because the co because the code for the code for it is. Is is held together by duct tape and prayer, but with but I'd li I'd like to start at the humble beginnings in a mm -hmm. sense. So, walk with walk me through your first introduction to role playing games and what made it stick. Oh my! Uh, like my first time, I was introduced to role-playing games. Mm -hmm. Ah, um, I think I was around twelve, from that age at least. And um, it was actually um, aside to school, there was a kind of program where you could, uh, well, basically try out. And uh, the um, the DM was also with like uh, a teacher. Who would uh, somewhat assess things throughout the, uh, uh, the the play, and uh, and then maybe give some uh, yeah, ideas or analyses? It was uh, quite interesting, and so that was the first time. And I remember because uh, when I had to create, so I didn't know anything about Dungeons and Dragons, but I knew a lot about Warhammer, for example. But I well, I painted, but I never played because I had no one to play with. So. So I, I was, still, and of course I was aware of you know, typical fantasy and probably Morrowind already and uh, Oblivion and all this. But the first time I played Dungeons and Dragon, it was Dungeons and Dragon especially, uh, I think 3.5. And um, it, um, yeah, I remember I asked the first time, okay, what's the most uh, less played race? <laughs> and so, well, I, I don't know if he knew if it's an actual thing, but he said, Halflin. And uh, I don't know why, if, I don't know if I chose monk on my own because I found it would be weird that basically a halfling monk, like someone who punches you, that's like half a meter, it can kill you. So it didn't make sense. So I found it funny, basically out of contrarianism. <laughs> so I made a halfling monk. And uh, well, overall, uh, it was quite fun because uh, you could see that I was more of a gamer because <laughs> we went outside and uh, there were barrels. The, the GM described barrels. So I say, well, I look in the barrel and say there are like rats and rot. And then I say, well, look at the other barrel. Well, there is like a banana or whatever. <laughs> and uh, well, yeah, it's, it's not like randomized loot. It's not, it's more like realistic. So I guess I, I picked it up. And I think I was really happy at one point because after a, a session, then what this teacher told me, it's good, but you should take more uh, action. Like you should uh, like a, a bit... Uh, not lead, but you no, know, try to explore more. And so then, right after that, I said, "Oh, I can do that." So I just went, of course, into a bar, and I said, "Like, uh, um, I took my purse of money, and I think I needed an information, and I just say, give me information. I have money.' Of course, 
no, we were kids, and uh, the GM, I think, thought, okay, it's cool, he's trying to, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> to express himself, whatever. So uh, he rewarded that. And I think that was a good, um, overall, it was a good experience, because then right after that, I bought the books, mm-hmm. 3.5. What three? Uh, and I already, I yeah, I tried to get my friends in, and I created my own campaign. And very fast, I was actually I was not a big fan of the setting, so I already made up a bit my setting with whatever I knew of the time. And uh, and very fast after, I just started already to make quite a lot of homebrew, and I mixed with uh, another game, which was a French tabletop RPG called the uh, the Dungeon of Nahalbuk, which is like a parody of Dungeons and Dragon. It's based on the, the Dark Eye, or the Black Eye, I forgot in German, right? Mm-hmm. And um, that's Schwarze Auge. And um, so, yeah, I basically made mix, and I it was really a bit crap, basically. But from, I really tried to, I know my world was really quite similar, actually, to this one. Um, a, a desert that, I think all the water was drained in a hole in the center of whatever this hollow earth. <laughs> and... Um, and you know the desert was everywhere, and um, yeah, lots of weird creatures. Um, of course, I had the, st- I still had like orcs, goblin, but I had other ones that I made up. So really fast, basically, I, I just didn't like much the setting, so I went away from it. And uh, and the rules all the time, I had some issues. It was mostly linked with uh, freedom, basically. I, of course, uh, I I see the value in, for example, class system, right? Um, but uh, I always had an issue. I, I didn't understand. Also, because sometimes I didn't read the lore. So sometimes there's a justification for it. But sometimes I was just, why if I'm like, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, well, yeah, a paladin, I can't do this. Like in reality, I could do this <laughs> if, I, if I had heavy armor or something like this. So I didn't like this kind of things. So that's why I was basically fixing it my own way, what, what most people do, I think, most uh, GM. And um, yeah, so that's the beginning, more or less. And, um, well, then I stopped a bit. I played online, I remember, because then I moved out of uh, my country and I was studying abroad. And so then I still wanted to play in my native tongue, so I used Roll20. And I went even further in... Um, well, I created my own character sheet there with my own... All the systems that I brought of initiative and all this, all my own setting as well. Also did something very weird, I think I never saw on Roll20, but basically I recreated... The whole map mm-hmm. uh, was in real size. So it was a bit like if you played Baldur's Gate, <laughs> but as a tabletop game. So I created a huge map where the players could move uh, freely, basically. Mm-hmm. But uh, I, was, I spent an, an immense amount of time doing this with Photoshop. It was quite well done also. It was not uh, you know, like uh, simple grids with uh, this. I really tried to put effort in this, which was not really smart, but I like the aesthetic, I guess. So I did this, and then, yeah, um, it was the 17th of July, 2020, uh, 2019, that uh, after I graduated mm-hmm. and uh, I applied to get uh, two masters, just to show off, <laughs> but uh, no, I applied, but then uh, I was a bit annoyed because I, I wanted to do something else. <laughs> So I kept one master because it seemed uh, not too burdensome. This that one, the other one was, and um, and then so I I remember ask my the first person I've met from Roll Twenty, which uh, really motivated me all the time to continue. Basically, I really liked uh, him as a player, and I told him, okay, oh sorry, my computer just ah uh, ah uh, uh, computer just crashed. No, it didn't crash. Haha. <laughs> Uh, well, it's okay. Uh, it seems fine. Uh, the so yeah, I told him okay. In one month, I make a campaign. Find me players. And so in one month, I uh, wrote as much as I could every day, uh, full time. It was in summer. And after one month, I made one game, and I didn't like it. So, uh, I think it was twenty fifth of August. And uh, then I said, okay, uh, give me time. I will do something better now. <laughs> and then it basically took two years and a half. And I'm going to make a new game finally with him shortly, like in a month or so. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, so that was the whole thing. Yeah. Now, one th- one thing that I one, it's funny that you mentioned the Elder Scrolls because one thing that I definitely saw when I looked at the visual design and the material you sent me 
mm-hmm. was a str- was a strong influence of the of uh, the Elder Scrolls, and, and in particular, um, Morrowind. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, if you want, I can yeah, go a bit more on this. Uh, yeah, for me, basically, Morrowind seems to maybe I don't know enough. Well, I have. Yeah, well, I'll go this way. But Morrowind for me seemed one of the uh, best uh, setting, just world building that I have explored in any kind of media I've seen. And um, even recently, when I had to read uh, so many tabletop RPG books, I found out you not know, the, uh, uh, was it Tecumel? And uh, oh, I forgot the names of these uh, huge settings, uh, Talislanta as well. And there's another one, uh, Yoruna. Mm-hmm. Yorune. Yeah, uh, these three, uh, they they uh, <laughs> they marked me as well because I said, "Oh wow, these are <laughs> these are big books as well, <laughs> big settings." And um, but still, I have more. Um, I think, well, Morrowind is a video game, also it's different the way you experience it, so maybe that's why. But Morrowind really had this um, concept of a foreigner in a foreign land. And um, of course, it's not just a mushroom, <laughs> which is what most people say. Of course, the mushroom do something, but there are many games that I've seen that they put mushrooms to somewhat imitate, but it, no, it doesn't work. <laughs> There's something a bit more than mushrooms. And so I've studied it a lot, actually. I've, I've looked at many interviews and uh, many oof, just people analyzing, and also um, the uh, forums on um, people who make new lore for Morrowind. To yeah, understand it a bit more and uh, learn from it in order to build my own lore. And um, well, I think yeah, the I've took I've taken also from many other places as well. I have a I have a list of inspirations, of course, <laughs> in one document, a lot of it. Yeah. But uh, overall, the world building uh, came uh, came mostly from uh, mostly actually a good part came from it. And uh, then on my own, I I think a lot about. How to um, seems it seems uh, very uh, a bit dumb, but how to be creative in the sense the methods of creating interesting or uh, unconventional, how to harmonize things that shouldn't be together in order to give you a product that seems appealing rather than just uh, ugly or <laughs> or uh, no too discordant that you don't understand it. So I really try my best to develop these kind of, of methods. And uh, and uh, yeah, I think Morrowind helped a lot in this aspect. But uh, I don't think if someone reads uh, the the lore that I've written on my societies and the people, because normally I have not copied anything in a sense. I've never not even re got inspired by directly by something. I just really try to find how did he, uh, how did they build it, and then I would say, okay, I might build it with the same tools, but not, uh, yeah, I like magicians that are authoritarian and, uh, and lives and, and yeah, and, and slavers and lives in the mushroom things. And I'll try, I will just change some keywords. I, I tried my best not to do so, but maybe it, maybe it will pop out, you know, out of my own will. Maybe I did it, of course, but I, I try my best not to. Yeah. And then yeah, the, the aesthetic of course is there because I, um, I'm not greatly skilled in art, in artworks. And um, uh, sketching is basically the level I can do, I think. But before, beyond that, I could not. Like, if it's some kind of realism, I cannot yet. Because I think I would do it if I could, but I can't. <laughs> so, uh, so I have this kind of uh, style, which is, um, yeah, a bit a lower quality of Kirk Bride or Moebius or even, yeah, a bit manga, I guess. And... Um, yeah, but overall, what I depict, I think, is uh, has yeah, it's, it will have feels of Morrowind because uh, of the the way I create these concepts. I think, but I'm not I'm not sure how they created these concepts. I just know one thing from Kirkbride, which was funny. He, he told uh, to uh, Todd Howard each time he would create a concept that's absolutely crazy. He would give it to Todd, and Todd would say, "That's too crazy. Please turn it down." And then he will draw the actual thing he wanted. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, it's uh, yeah, I like the concept, and um, so a lot, lot of this I try. But um, at least in writing, it's easier to be crazier for me than in drawing, because well, yeah, it's 
different skills. I think writing is more, well, it's more vague. Use words, it's not precise lines, I think. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, the writing are probably a bit more crazy than the drawings, but uh, these, they just have to wait until I become better. Mm -hmm. Hopefully. And yeah, that's all I have, I yeah. think, right now. Now, <laughs> that br now, that brings me to to the Discording Tales. Now, before we went live, we talked we talked about how when you have a more out there kind of setting, you need um, art is a bit of mm -hmm. more of a necessity. And you mentioned that when it came to doing play tests. Um, but when it but when it comes to when it comes to your when it comes to your particular style, would you say that, would you say that it's more analogous to some of the weird to some of the weird fiction in the old pulp days? It's possible, but I have not read any of these. <laughs> It's so it's uh, if it is, it's a coincidence because I have. Uh, interestingly, I'm not a great uh, reader of fiction or fantasy. It's uh, it's a bit curious in this aspect. Uh, maybe it's because I never had the I'm too lazy for it, or I never have the um, the will to immerse myself in someone else's world, and so it's rather on my own that I do it. <laughs> But um, and it's it's a, of course it's a, it's an issue because if you read all these uh, for, in a huge amount of uh, books and lores, you could get many ideas and sources. So I, I have the plan to force myself a bit to get um, more knowledgeable. Mm -hmm. But uh, officially, I don't have these directly. So if yeah, it's it will be coincidence then. Yeah. And uh, yeah, because I, I've looked a bit in like uh, yeah, old, for example, Sword and Planet. Uh, kinds of books, and I looked very fast, but it's recently that I did it. It's uh, because I was think I, I basically discovered these styles by researching them. Uh, I didn't grow with them, basically. What I I did read a lot of um, graphic novels, um, and uh, but the ones I read, well, we had some good ones. Well, Moebius, uh, if you know from uh, France, with uh, is it? yeah. Um, he wrote, he drew and wrote these uh, graphic novels, which were very, um, how, how was it called? Is it like heavy metal psychedelics, I guess, <laughs> kind of style. And, uh, this of course has inspired, for example, Michael Kirkbride, or um, I don't know if he says it somewhere, but it's, it's in the same kind of veins mm -hmm. where you mix, you mix, uh, yeah, like Star Wars in the past a bit. <laughs> And uh, you can see that a lot in Morrowind in some of these aspects. Uh, yeah. But um, so I had these a bit as influences. So I guess actually maybe you're right, but not too much. Most of the graphic novels I read were fantasy, but funny, <laughs> funny fantasy. Um, maybe it's just me, but I ended up getting vibes of John Carter more than Star Wars. But oh yeah, 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 you're right. Yeah, John Carter is uh, much, uh, I think, uh, more accurate in this aspect. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to when it com now when it comes when it comes to the the core mechanic, um, I did see that you're using a D six um, based system. But would it be accurate to say that you're that you're that um you've been tooling around with using um, fudge dice? Yes. So it is fudge. It's uh, yeah. It's basically fudge dice. It's just that right now I I don't have fudge dice. At home, so I use uh, d6s, mm -hmm. but I count them as fudge dice, right? Uh, minus zero and plus one. Yeah. And uh, no, d3s, but not three, not one, two, three. Mm -hmm. And yes, uh, the official, at least, me uh, dice mechanic you will always use is this pool. It's a uh, yeah, pool of fate dice, of five dice instead of four, which give me this range of minus five to plus five, which I like a lot because it's for I don't know, for the Typical brain of uh, at least uh, people of our time and in the West, I, at least it's very no five is very um, easy to uh, understand. Mm -hmm. And yeah, this um, this scale from minus to plus for me it makes also much more sense. That you know when it's below zero, thing is bad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when it's above, thing is good. Well, sometimes with if the the average is ten, I don't know, but I think in general it seems a bit less obvious. Uh, what what a result means, mm -hmm. and then from this I I went further. So actually, it's recently I reworked my dice mechanic because before I had another system, 
but uh, similar still, with also with a fate pool. But this one is the best right now that I have, and I think we'll keep it because I wanted realistic statistics. And what I meant for it is uh, that the more, the better you are, the more sure you are of your result, and of course, the greater is your potential. And so what this means in statistics is that your accuracy and precision uh, augments, uh, yeah, increases. And uh, for this, and then also I wanted fate dice and I wanted a pool and I wanted increasing, like you have more dice up to a certain point. So lots of things because I like to have more dice, but you shouldn't have too many dice. I like fate. <laughs> and uh, so I had to tweak with all this. And in the end, I have this, uh, I had to divide modifiers in two kinds. And basically, your expertise in a field, your experience mm -hmm. and knowledge, will add dice to your pool, which means that it will... But you still keep five dice of the total, of course. If, uh, yeah. And um, so what it means is that you will still make yeah from minus five to plus five, but you have more chances to go to plus five, the more dice you add to it. So you're more certain of your results. Mm -hmm. and, and then... Uh, you have your potential. I think I called it power modifier, but this might change, especially in English. <laughs> but um, um, the power modifier, for me, it's more uh, if you take the biological approach, yeah, your potential, or if you take more like Tolkien, your uh, divine or uh, god essence. Mm -hmm. And so this gives you your, rent, your possible range of action. And so for me, it's your attributes. So when you increase your attributes, you increase uh, from up to where you can see and, and you can't. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so that's why, for example, for me, uh, like the range of a mouse strength will never achieve the one of a uh, gorilla's strength mm -hmm. there. Um, but, well, it's, maybe the example is a bit off, but if the mouse... <laughs> trained itself to be strong well it will still not be that much its range will not increase of strength but it will be better within its range to reach the highest performance possible mm -hmm. so it would run faster for example it will run faster in the wheel uh, but up to its limit mm -hmm. it will not its limit will not increase uh, up to that point and so that's what I wanted to try to capture these uh, two differences between what you can do and how you can do it. And uh, yeah, for now, I have this system, which is not too bad. In the end, basically, you just have up to five dice you can add to your dice pool. That's your mastery. And then you just add this modifier at the end. So I've tested it. It seems, especially because it's fate dice. So it's minus one to plus one. It's very easy to count, very easy to see. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it, it even if it's more complex than no, roll one dice plus 12, of course. Huh? <laughs> Uh, I think the fact that it's fate and it's very low numbers, that it's okay enough. And uh, I think in general, people will roll as much probably as in uh, d and but I don't know. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. And officially, the GM, I, I took the stance that the GM doesn't have to roll unless he wants to. So you can just take the, at face val the, the values of whatever challenges and you don't have to roll for it. So that it, it fluidifies it. But of course, no. If you want, you do it. And there you go. <laughs> Not an issue there. Yeah. Now, one one um one particular thing I did I did notice is that there is you have you have the you have these set up with with attributes, then mm -hmm. sk then skills and then mastery. Ah yes. <laughs> um and it seems it seems like there is a it seems like there is a bit of a pecking order. At the top is attributes, then mm -hmm. sk then um sk then skills, then masteries, and then techniques. If I'm reading this right. Yes. Yes. Exactly. <clears throat> so, yeah. Basically, um, I also had the issue in Dungeons and Dragon. You have a skill is dependent on one attribute, mm -hmm. and for me it seemed always off because always I could see, but no, like intelligence should affect it or like dexterity. And in the first version of the game, I had three attributes, but I thought it's too much. I'll just get rid of it. <laughs> and I could... Um... So basically for me, it was uh, one attribute to define a skill was not enough. Mm -hmm. And three maybe starts to just become too, com too, too much. It's better, I guess, but it's, uh, for me, it was too much for me, at least. Two is good enough to give you uh, uh, yeah, something uh, interesting. And 
Also, this didn't arose only from there. It's because I wanted a, an uh, experience system, which uh, I also call, uh, found it more realistic, more based like in RuneScape, or I think I'm not wrong, <laughs> or uh, or even I think uh, is it uh, Burning Wheel? I think it has this kind of system where basically when you do something, when when you practice a skill, you get experience in it, which is for me it seems like realistic life, right? Rather than when you kill monsters or when you achieve a quest, you get this experience that you spend wherever you want. For me, it seemed a bit uh, off, but of course you can... Oh, cool. <laughs> Opinions there. But uh, I wanted more that, that you have to train for what you want and then you become better there. And so for this, I had to uh, rethink a bit these concepts of attributes, masteries and uh, skills. Mm -hmm. And uh, the idea was that skills encompasses all these different sub skills maybe there yeah, i've called them masteries mm -hmm. and um yeah such as uh, your fighting skill i think I call it melee but yeah fighting skill well you have your uh, sword fighting your spear spear fighting your wrestling and all these if you if you increase wrestling you will become a bit better probably in sword fighting even if it's not directly related to it but for me, it makes sense that it should impact. And the reason why, it's because it's linked to these two attributes. Um, and so when you when you do wrestling, you get experience in wrestling. And then when you total all the experiences of these masteries, like wrestling, sword fighting, it goes into your skill. Mm -hmm. And then your skill experience, you totalize all these skill experiences of similar attributes so for example yeah melee has uh, strength and dexterity and then uh, i think i have something like uh, exercise has uh, strength and constitution so if you um, sum up exercise experience and melee experience fight experience you will get the total experience for strength mm -hmm. and this it's automatic so it's not like a level when you reach a certain number, which is normally 100, 200, 300, 400, so it's very easy. Then poof, you have plus one in your strength. And so therefore, plus one in strength, it means you have plus one in melee, plus one in exercise and all this. Of course, it would be even better if it was a video game, it would be just smooth. But uh, the experience, you don't have much of it. It's uh, You make little check marks. It's all uh, 10, 20, 30, 40. It's, all these numbers are quite easy, I think, to remember overall. And um, the um, yeah, so it's it's all interconnected, and it, it creates this for me smooth aspect of it. Mm -hmm. uh, but it does complexify. That's true. Yeah. But overall, I think uh, the um, if you get especially the character sheet I've designed, I think is hopefully smart enough so that uh, people can really see it better. It's it's really well organized so that you can see that one skill is connected to these two. It creates also a DNA shape, mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's quite funny. I got it uh, that symbolizes the attributes, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. yeah, so basically, and, and yeah, I have, go for it. And um, with the, with within the, within that, because I've mm -hmm. I've de I've dealt with I've dealt with games that have de that have done the um, attribute skill sp skill specialization and um, kind of dichotomy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But a lot, a lot of times, the, a lot of times they end up being, the individual skills and and masteries end up being divorced from what divorced from one another, and that leads to a smaller variety, a smaller, oddly enough, a smaller skill pool because people don't want to um, put 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 points in put points in new skills that they that they might just that they're not going to be as good at compared to the rest of the party. Um. And the and the whole issue with choice paralysis also co also comes up in this kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so yeah. How do you, how do you plan to address that? So well, of course, with choice paralysis, I have the well. You lose a lot of it if you do it, but I say no. If you want to simplify the game, just remove all the masteries and you keep just the skills. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a very uh, radical, but it works there. And then uh, you have you lose a lot because there are not many skills actually in my system. There's only eleven skills. That encompasses then uh, these uh, 66 or something like that, 67, might have changed a bit, masteries. 
So you, you will lose a lot of precision in these uh, things, but you could do it. And then it, I think it will still be fine because you will still keep these uh, techniques, which are feats, basically. It's the equivalent of feats. It's just I didn't want to call them feats because at least in French, uh, it's more like something that you were born with, more or less. Uh, the equivalent of how they translate it in French. And while technique is more something you develop. Mm. And so I rather wanted this concept that you develop these techniques. You're not born with it because I have things where you're born with, but it's, uh, it's, it's differently called. And uh, so, yeah, for choice paralysis, I think uh, this aspect. And then also the uh, basically the main maxing and, uh, yeah, making a, an optimized character. Mm -hmm. um, I think my overall system and setting has a bit of a different goal than uh, traditional Dungeons & Dragon Because you have fighting, of course, there's a lot of rules about it. But I do stress a lot, and that's also why uh, I will come back after it. So... Uh, one of the setting, uh, the, the lore that I always uh, sort of bring out is what matters is the extreme um, expression of oneself in a field in particular. And so in my, the kind of campaigns that I would run is rather where um, you try to make these other tra other skill uh, masteries as uh, interesting as fighting, such as, you no know, or you know, if someone focuses on gluttony. I don't know, but some party might have a fun time in focusing on different aspects uh, than uh, fighting. And um, it's, I wanted, basically I want to make it very realistic. You know, if you don't focus on combat, yeah, you won't be good at combat and I won't balance it. Uh, that's it. Uh, but of course, then the, it's, I think it's the role of the GM to create, uh, the GM should not try to make, yeah, you go to a dungeon, you kill monsters, you get treasures. Because, yeah, it's, I don't think it will be exactly the kind of game where... Well, you could. If your party is... is you say you're making a, a kind of a fighting party, then yes, do it. No issues. Everything will be fine. Um, there are many skills for that, many masteries. But uh, then you can also go a bit differently. Or maybe you, you only... I think you have to somewhat establish this with uh, your party and how it's going. But uh, you have these options to go elsewhere. And about the choice paralysis... Um, the reason why I also wanted, instead of putting you no know, just uh, um, dotted lines with put your masteries there, so the ones that you picked up, it's because I wanted all my masteries to be on the character sheet so that people, they have this choice paralysis maybe, but then they see, what? Gluttony? That's a skill? You mean I can just like become super skilled at eating stuff? Or, uh, I don't know, uh, mimicry? Or all these. Well, in Dungeons and Dragons, they have put all of them, so they did it. Um, but I mean, mine, there's many more. So I wanted that when you look at your character sheet, you basically get somewhat inspired, at least maybe not when you create a character, that's true. But when you're in game, you're looking at all these options rather than just fighting. And you think, well, I can do like all these things. Because I think, no, you don't necessarily think about all these options. Especially when on your character sheet, you mostly have, you know, you, like a third of it is uh, like your weapons and uh, like the proportion of what is on your, your sheet, I think might influence uh, what people might be um, in, interested or like uh, might uh, be thinking about to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've seen, I've seen at least that it is, it did work in my early games where I already had uh, even before two years ago, where I had a lot of these skills, and uh, many players were thinking, I just want to try this skill. <laughs> so they, they, they wanted, and uh, some of them, I remember, one guy made a, a milk mafioso. That was his character. Another one was, uh, uh, it was just, a, a, how is it called in English? A, a handyman, <laughs> we'll call it this way. <laughs> he was a bit dumb handyman. And... Um, um, Another one did a merchant, more kind, and uh, yeah, it's basically I. You had the party like this. I didn't force them. I just say make the, the most. Uh, I wanted them to make interesting characters because that's what I like to play with. Mm -hmm. uh, try to be as creative as possible and as funny. Also, I like <laughs> I like fun, <laughs> but I like funny uh, scenarios. And um, it's uh, and yeah, they created all these characters, and then I. I didn't, well, even my scenarios tend to be quite free-forming. You didn't get any aspects uh, of uh, how the GM should play. You know, I have written basically these uh, aspects as well. I didn't give it to you, but uh, not only how he should play, but the kind of yeah, settings and uh, 
see, there are no real scenarios. Basically, I really advocate for yeah, building more like a sandbox um, world, uh, which is uh, uh, yeah, um, uh, breathing and organic, at least at best as one could. Of course, I'm building also a camp. I think we call that a campaign that you can use. Uh, it's already already and with everything there. Uh, but it's not really a campaign, right? It's more like uh, it's a bit like if you've uh, seen uh, ultraviolet grasslands. Yes. Uh, tabletop RPG. Yeah. So it's a bit. It has these aspects where you have all these locations. You go there. There are things to do that pop out to you, and you do whatever a bit. Uh, in ultraviolet grasslands, the goal is making uh, caravans, I guess, uh, trading a bit, <laughs> trading, going to one place, and trading and exploring. I think those are the two things that rewards you. And I uh, have a lot of this aspect as well. Um, so, yeah, I think the, the short answer is I have all these skills so that it gives people uh, maybe, hopefully, more ideas to explore all these other aspects as well. And... Uh, but uh, fighting is always there and it's always really important. So it's it's just in this aspect, and uh, at least all the players that I always had were never, at least they they never seem to have the drive to uh, min max in just fighting or, or they would do it, but you see because they have all the other players that don't do this, then it just creates actually a quite uh, harmonious, <laughs> heterogeneous but uh, compatible uh, team where you have someone who is very strong in fighting and the other in you know talking and all this and they you have to create then yeah encounters that maybe fit somewhat even if i don't advocate for balancing so uh, it's uh yeah one of the yeah basically if you think if you if you get the the idea that there is no balancing in my game i think it it fits it's, it becomes more understandable that then you just live in this world and well you've made your choices and you have to uh navigate through it <laughs> And one thing that I one thing that I certainly noticed is the fact that unless I'm mis unless I'm mistaken on this, mm -hmm. you're kind you're kind of using a archetype system in in character creation, mm -hmm. not, necessarily, uh, not necessarily not necessarily classes in the way it's traditionally yeah. gone, but um, a set of starting packages. So yes, um, basically there are I would say there are three ways to create your character. There is the very very long way, which is probably people will think say it's like Fatal 2.0. No, <laughs> you can no, yes. No, no, this is not that far. I'd say <laughs> no. <laughs> but there is a lot that you can do, and there's lots of aspects there which you can roll if you want, or you can just pick them out. But everything is there, and it impacts your 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 life. But not I have hopefully focused on the things that. No, are relevant, and uh, there's nothing I think too uh, controversial there. Um, I have read Fatal though, so I had to, to study it to uh, learn <laughs> from the mistakes of people. I think, and um, but no, yeah, I think I'm quite uh, different from <laughs> from this. But uh, yeah, so so that's the, the the hardcore I say character creation if you really want to. But then I have the I say in between where. Um, you it can be quite fast. You just uh, look at the the races, the species. Actually, I call them species. Then have subspecies, and um, you you pick them. You have almost all the attributes that are already given. Then to it you add uh, you you um, oh yeah you have to oh yeah the archetype. That's what you were talking about. I think it's the symbol, right? The the system of symbols. Yes. Uh, which yeah yeah. Okay, so I'll just focus on this. So the the symbols is. Uh, um, it's also coming mostly from Morrowind, actually. Uh, in Morrowind, right, you choose your birth sign and you get um, some uh, boosts in your skills, and also, and that's it, I think, right? Or maybe they increase they did, faster, but I'm not sure. Um, <clears throat> Morrowind and Oblivion did have did have the mix of a, of a class and a sign. Mm. It wasn't until Skyrim that they abandoned the class yeah. system. To a but, statue, if you ask me, yeah. but I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> oh, yeah. So in my system, it's just I had the the idea because I did. I was told that I was not a big fan of classes in general it, when they restrict you. I rather want something that just gives you a boost, which I think quite um, maybe people won't like it. It's a bit modern thinking in some aspects. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, me, I do. I don't like these. I like that the restrictions are realistic. Like you've made these 
the restriction yourself in more uh, because like okay, you're not strong. That's it. Uh, it's not, uh, there is some kind of magic uh, essence that just says you can't wear this. Uh, for me, it's a, it was a bit too off, at least for my setting. So uh, there you go. But yeah, these archetypes, all they do is uh, if you take the, uh, them, well, you have well, well, you can make your own as well. But basically, it will just do that when you gain experience, you gain a bit more. Uh, and uh, the way it's done, it's normally, for example, for your masteries, you increase by one mastery each 11, 22, 33, and 44. And then if you have, if your your skill is symbolistic, symbolic, sorry, in, <laughs> in English, symbolic, um, then it will be just 10, 20, 30, 40. Uh, I might change the numbers, of course, but uh, the, this is it. And then it's the same for attributes, but it's a bigger boost. It's instead of 100, 200, 400, uh, 300, 400, it's... I think 75, 150, it's 25%, basically. And so all it means is that, yeah, you will become um, faster, better, faster in these uh, in these ways. But of course, you can do anything else if you want. It's just, uh, it, will, uh, it will make you better, faster there. And also, it will preserve your skills, because if you play with the rules of degeneracy, uh, of like skill degenerescence, uh, then basically, well, uh, some skills might go down if you don't train them. Mm -hmm. But that's for or harder rules and um yeah and these symbols they uh, i actually took the word symbol because of its ancient greek meaning which uh, it's basically a symbol was something broken in half mm -hmm. that you had to connect again to uh, reconnect <laughs> and so imagine like a heart broken in half you give to two lovers and they go and then they meet again and they connect it there you go and that's the symbol and i had this basically this concept uh, to make it more based in the lore is the more you interact with which what is your essence, biology, or destiny, you know, you can find different uh, meanings, the more you express yourself in this way, the, the more you realize yourself at what you, yeah, what you, what you maybe ought to be at least, or where you could be the best. So, and that, that was all. So it's, it's a system that will reward you to focus in uh, some aspects. But it's very free-forming there. And the reason why I talked about creation before is because I have uh, maybe, I think what I gave you didn't have it, but I have also just uh, have archetypes. They're actually called archetypes. And it's just, uh, it's a small character sheet already with all the data and you can just pick it. And there you go, you have like this guy from blah, 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 short text about them, equipment, everything is there. It's, uh, it's on a third of a page. It, all, all the information and you can just fill it in your character sheet and then it's fine so that that's what's the other thing uh, if you want fast character creation yeah but, but yeah these archetypes are the, these uh, symbols are the, my kind of class system and all it what it does is uh, boosting your uh, your your experience and i have an optional rule which i thought maybe if you want to make them more potent and more like a class um you will be only able to learn techniques from symbolic skills. Mm -hmm. so there you go. Then you create a more of a class system. Uh, Mia will probably not play with these kind of rules, but uh, if you want, you could do this. And then I think it will make it much more like a class because, well, yeah, you lose all these kind of uh, extra tips, <laughs> extra things. Mm -hmm. And yeah, these techniques are quite different from feats as well, at least in some aspect. <sighs> now, with, now, with that in mind, I'd like to shift over into the supernatural end of things. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Into into well, not to put too fine a point yeah. in it, but let's talk about. No, no of course, magic. Yeah, 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 magic. Uh, yeah. Now, would it be would it be fair of me to say that ma that magic is its own its own set its own set of skills instead instead of being something fire yeah. and forget? Yeah. So magic, I think here. Uh, I don't know if someone did this, uh, but I never found this anywhere, at least in any other books. Um, it's, it should be. I'm, I'm sure some maybe Asian ta table RPG maybe would have that. It, I, it would make sense if they did. But basically, um, it's a mix. I have inspired a lot from Ars Magica. And I think anyone who played Mar Ars Magica, they would see, okay, there is like a strong influence there. Very strong. And... Uh, but then, yeah, put my own twist, and I also took from many other places, of course. But this is the biggest influence, and so you have two ways of do two um, um, what's it uh, tools to do magic. You have um, 
what I call re relationships, which is basically uh, in Ars Magica, you had the same system. We had five kind of them. You have four only, which is how you're going to manipulate the elements, right? So you can create, destroy, move, uh, perceive. Well, yeah, and probably one more. <laughs> I forgot. But yeah, so we have this. And then you have uh, the elements. And me, I have, uh, they're called the spirits because my system is much more based in animism. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a lot of lore about it, of course. And um, and you have eight families of spirits. We'll call them, and they're called reels, <laughs> of course. And uh, the way that is interesting, I think, in my system is that your relationships, so this first thing where, in which you manipulate the elements, your bonus there is based on a pair of two of your attributes. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so what it, it means is that basically anyone has, well, it, wherever you, whatever is your build, you would have some kind of possibility to be good in a way of interacting with the magic world. Uh, also, what it means is to increase this aspect, you need to improve these attributes. And so I find it funny that you no, know, the uh, wizard of some kind has to do push-ups or has to be empathetic or has to uh, you know, take hits to become better in his magic kind or uh, yeah, more graceful, more creative, more instinct insightful. And so you have this aspect. But of course, there is a, there is a limiting thing. Uh, even if you are very high in your relationships, a big bonus, you can't do the magic because for this, you need to basically honor these uh, spirits. And it's only when you've taken these steps of honoring these reals, spirits, right, that then you have access to these circles of magic. Hmm. So you do have to do something, but anyone could, and the thing is the more, <laughs> and honoring magic is also quite special in my system because I had to create many rules to uh, limit, right, the power of magic. And um, as it is in these worlds, and uh, the one of the the rule that I figured out that would be interesting is whenever you practice some honoration with a rule, it will take you some sort of a part of yourself which is linked with the the spirit in question, and it will uh, dissipate, evaporate in the surrounding spirit families that are connected to it. This is all uh, RP, right? It doesn't have uh, specific uh, rule-based uh, consequences. The rule-based consequences is you, you, you get tired. Mm -hmm. But for example, uh, so each time you do this magic, uh, you do a uh, magic of energy, which is no control of heat and cold, uh, mm -hmm. movement of particles, we'd say today. Yep. Uh, well, it will dissipate your own heat uh, into either uh, yeah, what I connected is, is uh, idea, uh, senses, or it will dissipate into gases. Mm -hmm. So a magician will lose his heat and either maybe some of like images like mirage would appear around him, mm -hmm. or maybe it will turn into gases. Some gases will come out of him. So I just uh, like this concept. Mm -hmm. And uh, another aspect to improve, this is more like when you do, when you honor a reel, it does this to you. So it's, you know, you have to be careful. And the other aspect is to access to the reels. Uh, I should have thought about this before, but I know I mix up a lot of things. <laughs> uh, when you want to access to the circles, it's um, you have to to make these kinds of uh, sacrifices. And uh, the most common sacrifice is well, you sacrifice. The etymology means to separate yourself from. Mm -hmm. uh, to, yeah, to yeah, to separate actually to separate, and uh, and so that's what you do. So if you want to be more in touch with fire or energy well you have to make the fire greater around you whenever you see a fire you try to make it bigger mm -hmm. uh, or you want to yeah maybe always have also you want to never touch the fire because you don't want to benefit from it right you want to let it let it grow so you will get away from the sun you always wear something so you, you know hood and the more you you sacrifice yourself from a family of real, the more you have access to its power because it's, well, it's be, you're basically you're respecting him and so therefore it respects you back. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's why even if you're really strong in, you have this kind of potential to do magic, if you don't 
do the sacrifices for it, you will not be able to access mm -hmm. to it. Now, <laughs> now, since since we're on that kick, I'd like to go. A I'd like to go a little bit into um, combat. Mm hmm. Because let's see. Uh... One of the, one of the one of the key things that 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 I usually de I usually delve into is when you have when you have a variety when you have a variety of build, making sure that say purely martial characters you know the characters that always get the short end of the stick in the Elder Scrolls um, mm -hmm. are able are able to able to contribute with with more than with more than just the single basic action. I.e. Yeah, yeah. I.e. I hate. I um. I've made this clear over the years. I hate the standard fighter narrative, <laughs> or the idea that the that human fighter is Babby's first class, or Babby's first build. I suppose I should say, but you get you get the idea. Yes. Uh, let's see. I'll just open a little uh, thing because yeah, you didn't get also the technique because I have all of them, the four hundred techniques or so. There's no way I was uh, going to be able to go through all all of that. Yeah, I know, I know, <laughs> and it's. Uh, yeah. But uh, I think that's the funniest aspect, actually, of my game. At least, uh, if you want fun, it's there because uh, one of the the core design uh, that I had in mind when I designed them mm -hmm. is uh, I didn't want them to be plus five percent something. You know, like just a cosmetic thing that increases skill. I wanted that they give you a new perspective or a new tool mm -hmm. and uh, the way i did it is i always i put the mastery and then i had a line of i think 15 um col columns which were like social support intelligent stealthy and all these things then i tried to find okay how can you be stealthy with this how can you be smart with this how can you be da 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 da, da? so that basically every single kind of masteries could be expressed through every single kind of attributes. Mm -hmm. So I found it quite interesting, at least, uh, you know, it means you can be, well, yeah, you can be a bard in many different ways <laughs> and you can be a fighter in many different ways. Mm -hmm. But of course, always I have this, uh, <laughs> this kind of uh, thing in my head that tries to somewhat be realistic. I will probably make, it, make an expansion in the future, which would be totally absurd and crazy, <laughs> but this is the baseline. And um, yeah, so I bought, uh, yeah, I think, um, so first, the, have you, do you know of Aces and Eight? Yes. Or I think not, wait, there, there's another one, I think it's Hackmaster, they have it. Yes. As well as Hackmaster, I think it's, no, they have this count system instead of initiative. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so I have this as well, uh, for me. Uh, it seemed the most interesting. I have also retweaked it and uh, I've really harmonized a lot of it. So everything seems simpler in my eyes. Mm -hmm. um, where, uh, yeah, it's all, all the numbers are somewhat familiar. They're small and they're logically consistent, more or less. At least I tried my best for this because, yeah, in these, at least I know Hackmaster, but Aces and Eight, all the numbers were like very different. So you will never remember any of, the, of it, I think. Mm -hmm. But, uh, so I've done all this, and um, well, I have all these, of course. But well, what is the what I have to tell is what is different from my fighter com compared to other fighter or for the fighters from other games, basically. Because uh, well, yeah, uh, they all have maneuvers. Some weapons will. Have Have advantages. For example, if you t uh, because yeah, my weapons have these four values, which are inertia, which is basically how fast they attack with counts in initiative. Uh, then you have um, versatility, which is basically the bonus they give. It's it's how you no know, quick you are to like uh, no the edge length, uh, how uh, good it is to parry, how um, precise it is to to hit. So it's all these, it's just basically the bonus you use when you throw the dice. Then you had reach. So, um, well, yeah, it uh, reach uh, is important, but how it, or, or
for mass. And a web, of course, a sword, you can half sword it or more Dao, right? Yeah. <laughs> and I have, the, I have these rules and I have the techniques for this in my system. So at least that's um, good Easter eggs there. But no, it's true. It, it's useful. And the spears, it's quite hard there to, um, they have no, almost no, res they have no resource, basically. Uh, you, you can't do much with it. So I think there's some balance there, even if like, they probably have some advantage in general, as you know, it, it was in the past. Mm -hmm. But uh, in certain situations, they don't. And uh, yeah, for example, if you use some kinds of weapons, like if you use axe, you can uh, disable uh, more easily people with shields. Mm -hmm. Or also when you go closer, you can also grab people with the axe, right? Because it has hooks in general, a hook shaped a blade, which means that, well, yeah, uh, then, then they come in closer combat to you and then you can uh, wrestle. And for example, with an axe, you can fight with an axe in very close combat because of this. Well, if you had a sword, even if you go half swording, it's too close to you at that point, right? Because it's if you're really uh, like wrestling mode. Well, with an axe, you can use it as like an American fist, more or less, and, and, and use it still if you wanted to. So I think uh, the versatility, the, these uh, attributes of weapons will probably give quite a lot to work with if you're a fighter and if you want to think in different situations what to use. And... Um, then, yeah, the maneuvers that I have, I don't think there is much different. You have a repositioning that's very famous. You have a, I don't know how it's called in English, a font. It's the thing where, you know, you you um, stretch yourself forward to the utmost with usually a sword so that basically you just hit a bit further. And so that could be practical. You can feint, uh, which well, it's a bit like defending yourself to get a better position then. Also, yeah, oh, for example, one thing you can do is you can, because of the Hackmaster kind of system, you can cancel an attack. So you can react a bit when you see things a bit faster than in a turn-based system. Mm -hmm. At least, well, you have reactions in turn-based system, it's true. Uh, but here, I think you, well, it's, it seems more, you, uh, you can really react before the thing happens to you. <laughs> you, you can pre-act, we'll say. And um, and then my maneuvers, I think they're the same. I'm really happy with my maneuver system because it's so simple in my eyes. It's, uh, well, you drew a roll and according to how much higher you have than the enemy uh, value or roll, it gives you how much you can do. So if you just equalize, it means you grappled him. If you have plus one, you can push him or drag him a bit. Mm -hmm. Or you can grapple him, uh, gr grab him even stronger at plus one. At plus two, you can... Uh, you can push him further or drag him further, or you can put it to the ground. At plus three, you can put it to the ground, or you can even throw it. So it seems very logical for me, because when I looked at like Pathfinder, which is the system I used most uh, yeah, when I was younger, I, I just always forgot everything. <laughs> and uh, it's just, yeah, it, it seems like always specific rules for everything. Well, here it's all on a gradient, and it's quite logical. You grab, and then you push or drag, and then you throw, uh, for me, it seems very uh, fluid. It, like that's how you would do it. Basically, the stronger you would be, the more you could do this. So, but this is quite yeah, more or less. It's maneuvers and maneuvers exist in all these games. So I don't think I'm much more there in this aspect. Mm -hmm. um, movement can be a bit uh, impacted differently because you can attack while moving in my system, which I don't think they have in Hackmaster. Well, maybe they do, but I didn't read it. But uh, I, I at least they didn't have in Aces and Eight. <laughs> So uh, I don't know, <laughs> but uh, it's it makes sense, right? Why you, why you can't just attack and move, but here you can. So I think you have uh, much more um, ambivalence as a fighter in this system, at least, uh, to react and to uh, not be stuck, basically, or yeah, or something like this. And then um, yeah, if you add to this the techniques that I have. Um, they they have a lot of interesting um, stuff. Well, yeah, for example, yeah, the, the, with a web with a sword, you can uh, grip it or mortal. Of course, you could do it without it, but you have some. Well, it it means like it's more like uh, someone told you you can do this because apparently, you no, know, most people we gave them sword, and up until recently, no one thought you could do it. Like no one, but uh, most people know. <laughs> so apparently, if you don't tell people that you can do it, they don't do it, right? <laughs> so that's uh, so uh, they. Uh, that's why it's a technique. You somewhat have to uh, figure it out. And these techniques, you can learn them by yourself. It's an optional rule if you are creative enough, because I have creativity as an attribute. So uh, 
this you have some boosts in this uh, attribute. Yeah. And um, yeah, I have these uh, flexible weapons, right? Uh, like uh, flails and <laughs> I'll say nun nunchaku, right? <laughs> to just to uh, go with uh, uh, Shadiversity's uh, latest videos. But uh, basically, the only aspects that uh, oh, flail are better, at least. <laughs> flails, um, well, they can reach yeah, be beyond, beyond the shield. Or um, I don't remember else what I had, but. Uh, Oh yeah, whips as well are, are into this. So of course you can grab members, um, yeah, arms or so, all this. So I think that basically my weapons, interestingly, none of them have really a specific rule, like you would see in uh, Dungeons and Dragons Pathfinder, which is like reach or uh, you know flexible. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just that they all have these four values that uh, are all different. So I have I think two hundred or so weapons, and of course. Uh, well, I won't say the, the changes are cosmetic. They all have a different combination of every single one of them. And then they have their different types, mm -hmm. which, yeah, here, they, here are specific rules. Yes, you have a type, uh, which the type only matters when you start to have techniques, because then you have these specific techniques for each weapon types. Mm -hmm. And um, and then, yeah, you, you, you get all these kind of fun, fancy things you can do with an axe that you can't do with a weapon, with a sword, or uh, yeah, all these. So, um, yeah, also the weapons, I think it's quite funny because I really, I, I have taken everything I could find uh, I have that I've never saw in so many uh, uh, settings. And I've tried to translate them. Oh, yeah, the translation might have been very crap <laughs> for the weapons. <laughs> but uh, in French, it, it, it made sense. But of course, I would translate them better because I wanted to make them um, not based, well, call them by what they are called in their own language. So um, I don't remember, but I think basically uh, these uh, wakizashi or, or uh, I don't know how to pronounce them, but these uh, Japanese or Asian um, Chinese uh, swords, they mean, basically means a curved sword or something like that. So that I try to call them as yeah, they are actually called rather than call them wakizashi, because for me it would seem off then, because it would get rid of the setting. Because mm -hmm. like, oh, what? They have like Japanese weapons, but <laughs> they're not Japanese. <laughs> so... Uh, so I've tried to purge all this, and I really tried to find all these weird weapons. Mm -hmm. And also, I've added weapons which could have existed in this kind of, yeah, well, it's a weird te technological era. My era is a bit different, but still, it has lots of this uh, primitive era, or medieval at least. And I've added those that could have existed there, but didn't, because people didn't think about it. And the best one I have is from this YouTuber, Jörg Sprav, uh, German, if I'm not wrong. Who did this, for example, pendulum bow, uh, where you attach two bow to each other with a recharge uh, <laughs> mechanism, and basically one bow pulls the other, so it makes it a bit like a repeating uh, bow, which is uh, easier for people. It's a bit like repeating crossbows as well, but slightly different. So I have this, for example. So I have all this kind of, and this could have existed then. They even actually had a video to try to prove that a medieval person could have done it. <laughs> So I have all these aspects. I also follow the Todd's Workshop, which does a lot of uh, trials uh, with all these weird um, well, crossbow types, all these mechanisms to recharge crossbows. You have all these. Uh, this you couldn't see because uh, it's in the advanced rule that I have. But uh, there's lots of things you can do with bows and arrows. There are lots of bows and arrows as well in the different types. So I think yeah, the, the um, diversity of all these weapons uh, with their type plus their... Uh, values uh, at least give some things to think about if you're a fighter. <laughs> mm -hmm. As long as well. As... <laughs> yeah. Now, I know that you're. I know that this is current. That this is in development. And you're having to. You're, mm -hmm. you're having to juggle between developing the game and tr and translating the thing. But mm -hmm. um, do you have? Do you have a do you have a do you have a target in mind as far as put as far as putting out some degree of an alpha? Yes. Um, so the idea, because it's a good date, it's uh, the, uh, I think if I'm not wrong, the 22nd of February 2022, probably at uh, <laughs> 2022 as well, <laughs> in hours. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, just I like the number, and I don't know if I'll have the English, but I'll have the English soon enough. I'll probably have a yeah crap English version <laughs> um, before I really rework it. But I will have at least a French alpha, 
And then shortly enough, I'll have the English alpha because, uh, well, actually, tell me, how was this uh, uh, English version? Like, like would it's, it be okay? Um, or there's there's parts that, there's parts that were a little wordy, and I had to, and I and it was very yeah. very clear that this was done through an auto translator. Yeah. Um. I'd say I'd say I would. This particular this particular thing works works nice as a first draft, but yeah, I think, yeah. You, I think of course, of course. <laughs> I I'd, I'd advise I'd advise having a having a having a human look over it and get to the yeah the, get the spirit of the wor of the wording instead instead mm -hmm. of straight to the letter. Although, yeah, well, yeah, I, I will. Uh, yeah, it's it was just to see because I, yeah, I did it really fast, right? I just auto translate and then I read it through the whole day basically, and I corrected everything I could think of uh, quite fast. But uh, I think normally I should be, of course, I'm not a native <laughs> uh, English but uh, speaker, but I've studied uh, at least in English speaking country for five years, and I've write academic academically. So normally I should be able to, at least if I do it correctly, right? Mm -hmm. I should be able to produce something that is clear enough, at least uh, from my background. But then, uh, yeah, if you if I want to have a well, yeah, I, I would have to have someone. Uh, uh, which is his native tongue to read it to see these kind of little mistakes that you always make. Mm. But uh, I think if I translate it myself, it should be normally well. No, like when you write a scientific paper, uh, well, most people don't. It's not a native tongue, and uh, well, no, usually it works. People are you can read it. So, um, mm. but yeah, of course, uh, when I do the English version, I will I will translate it myself mm -hmm. so that. Normally, the, like, everything should be clear enough, and then in the later version, of course, I will make it uh, like a real book. <laughs> mm -hmm. But with that, with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule and braving the hell of time zones to come all the way up to the temple. <laughs> I thank you for uh, well inviting me, especially it's the first uh, time mm -hmm. that basically this is out officially. And uh, well, it would probably be helpful for uh, some to already uh, understand a bit more, maybe what all this is about. Mm -hmm. Well, I hope I hope it's not the last time. No. <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, yeah, it will. Uh, I don't think this will die. So uh, it, it, there's no chance, and it uh, it will uh, continue. And it, I think, I will reach something uh, quite soon enough. And uh, yeah, I, I don't have any reasons to stop it or yeah you know, to abandon it or anything like this. So it, it will come out, and uh, hopefully soon enough. Hopefully soon enough in English as well. <laughs> mm -hmm. But any time, any time you see fit to return to the temple, whether it's to discuss further development or just to mm. just to laugh at the bard dying again, uh, the door is always open. Okay, as I good. often say around here. Drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Nice. Well, you have some issues. I don't drink. <gasps> Am I still allowed? Yes. <laughs> not a heresy. Good. No, no but uh, it's okay. I, I will. Uh, I will try to to drink something that is uh, poisoned enough so that uh, it uh, appears I am in a similar state of mind. <laughs> um. <laughs> you could always you could always drink salt water. <laughs> well, anything poisonous it makes your mind high to some kind. <laughs> but with that with that said, I'd also like to give a sincere thanks to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present. My name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>